Now, force, of course, is is the wrong way of putting it. I mean, you're not you're not jumping someone in an alley for their wallet, right? But the reality is that that children need structure. Children, children's brains are immature. They cannot see over the horizon of their immediate behaviors to that which is beneficial for them. Hell, a lot of adults can't do it either, but I think that's because they didn't get those lessons as children, right? Mm. I mean, I've explained a lot about oral hygiene to my daughter that I, I have a responsibility to protect her future self. Right. I have a responsibility to deliver her to adulthood as a functional and healthy human being. And I said, I know a lot about how to do that, but you're five. And you don't know a lot about how to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. You're just five. And so you can't know, right? And so as, as parents, we absolutely need to override our children's preferences at times. There's no, I mean, otherwise they should just be out getting, like they're, they're adults, go, go have, earn a living. I don't go out and interfere with other people's decisions unless they're initiating force against me, because they're adults. They can go and live and fall by their own efforts and ambitions and choices and all that, right? But children can't. And so there is something in the old saying which says, when you live under my roof, you do as I say. Now, that's oh, all that, kinds that of wrong. That sense shudders down my spine. <laughs> no, but there's truth in it. And the truth is, oh, like if that. you are dependent on me for your income and shelter... It means that you are not ready for the world yet, which means I know a lot more about you because I'm in the position of providing you the shelter. You are in the receiving position of charity. I am in the provision of charity. And therefore, I am going to, I know more about what you need than you do because you are a child. And if you knew everything about what you needed and you could make all these wise decisions, you wouldn't need me to pay your bills, right? Hmm. Wow. Your daughter cannot make wise decisions about how to spend her time because she was 12. Right. So, so you don't think Which advising is, right? is enough? I mean, I. I well, you I, tell I, me. I, Has advising been enough? Well, no. <laughs> Listen, do you know how many people call into the show and get what I think is stellar advice? Mike, how many people really dig in and do the things which we talk about in this show? Uh, not as many as I'd like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mike, that's good dodge modeling, Mike. You must have been like a squid at dodgeball, just slithering all over the walls and putting out ink into the air and shit like that. It's a small percentage. It's definitely a small percentage. Uh, you know, I would say maybe 10% mm -hmm. or maybe 15% of people really dig in. And the people who sustain it over a long period of time, you know, I think that we're at about diet book level, which is like two to three percent of people really get it, really dig in, and really hang in there for the long haul. Would you say that's about right? Yeah, I'd say so. Now, I think many more people than that take useful advice in the short run and fix immediate problems. But then they like, oh, good, my problem is solved, right? So you say, oh, you know, this person doesn't sound like a healthy person to go out with. Great, I've broken up with this person, right? And then the next relationship is, you know, whatever, right? But they will take advice and deal with an immediate problem. But do they actually dig to the root of things and get the therapy and, and the self-knowledge and live by their principles and continue to study philosophy for the rest of their lives? Well, no, most people who diet end up gaining back more weight. And most people who dabble in philosophy end up with their lives worse off in many ways. But people who really dig in and change their lifestyle, well, they end up like the 2 to 3% of dieters who actually lose the weight and keep it off, right? And we know this from donations, right? I mean, we're actually doing less this month than we have last month. And donations being 2 to 3% of listeners, well, those are the 2 to 3% of listeners who are really not treating the show as, uh, a, a, you know, strangely accented, hyperactive entertainment, but are actually saying, wow, you know, I could really live this way. So... Advice, I'm telling you, as somebody who kind of gives advice <laughs> for a living, eh, doesn't that work, even with adults? So you're saying I have to force her? No, I'm not saying you have to force her. Because you've got, like, you're either consultant or Stalin. You know? <laughs> this may be a bit of a false <laughs> dichotomy, right? Yeah, I don't want to be a Stalin. No, of course you don't want to be a <clears throat> Stalin. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to be a Stalin, of course.
I don't have to tie my child down to make her brush her teeth. Mm. Right? I don't have to tie my child down to make her eat her vegetables. But, but, right? but if you advise your child not, uh, to clean her teeth and she doesn't. No, I say, I'm sorry, we have to clean her teeth. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, we have to. Right. You're like, well, I don't want to. Well, look, I'm sorry that you don't want to. I, if it's any consolation, I hate brushing my teeth too. If it's any other consolation, there are six billion people in the world, and six billion people in the world hate brushing their teeth and hate flossing. It's boring. Right? Nobody likes it. You just have to do it. And, you know, we go over the explanations and this and that and the other, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, you, you, I mean, you have to. Like I'm, it's not you imposing your will. It's you relating reality to your children, right? See, Stalin was just an asshole who imposed his will on people, right? Yeah. But if you say to your child, "Fire burns you," are you imposing your personal will on your child? You know, you are informing them of the facts of reality. Yeah. It's not your fault that studying is hard sometimes. It's not your fault that a lot of life is not a huge amount of fun. And we actually have more fun than most people had throughout history. It's not your fault that we have to take shits in the morning. It's not your fault that we can't eat chocolate all the time. This is just reality. It's not your fault that gravity means don't jump off that wall. You're not imposing your will on her. You are informing her of the facts of reality. And the facts of reality is that if you play computer games all the time, you will live under a bridge in a van down by the river on a steady diet of government cheese for the rest of your natural days, right? I have said that to her several times. So she has to study. Right. Time to get off the computer. Time to study. My daughter is not, she loves numbers. She's not a huge fan at all of reading. In fact, sometimes she cries when she's learning how to read. She gets so frustrated, she gets so upset, she cries. And I give her a big hug and I tell her, I'm so sorry. I remember her learning how to read for every rule. It's like there are 10 exceptions. It's really frustrating. English is a weird language. Like it used to be pronounced plach, but now it's plow, which is why it's O-U-G-H, mm -hmm. you know, plow. But enough is O-U-G-H, but it's U-F-F. -F, and I told her about that old George Bernard Shaw thing where he spells out G-H-O-T-I and says, using English rules, you can pronounce that fish, <laughs> right? And um, from station and, and um, enough and all that, right? It, it's, it's a ridiculous – and I said, you know, but it, it, it just evolved, right? I mean, so people used to say plach and they used to pronounce things differently and that's how they spelt it. And then the, the pronunciation changed because people's throats got sore speaking like Germans all the time. Mm. And, and they kept, but they couldn't go back and change all the spelling. So they just kept the spelling of the old. It's, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes. And it's really frustrating and it is annoying and it's absolutely essential. And I say to her, I said, you don't know yet how cool reading is because it's really, really, really tough to read, to learn how to read. It's really tough. And you, at the age of five, do not know why reading is important. Because right now, you can just have people read for you or, you know, like a, there's not, you know, if you need something in Dragon Vale, I can read it for you. Or yeah. if there's a cartoon on TV, you don't even know how to, you don't need to know how to read. So you don't know how important reading is. You don't even know all of the fantastic books that you will be able to read and the lifelong learning that you will be able to achieve, the self-education that will keep you at the forefront of human value. You don't know all of that. You don't even know all the books in the world you can't read. You don't know all of the knowledge that you will not get if you don't learn how to read. You, you don't know. All you know is that reading is really annoying right now. At times. Sometimes she likes it, but most times she doesn't want to. And so I, I'm sorry that it's frustrating for her. I sympathize and I understand that it's frustrating for her, but she needs to learn how to read. Because if we don't do it now, like between the age of five and a half to like seven or eight is like the brain's window for learning how to read. And if you don't learn during that time, it's really hard to learn later. And I think that you never really become that great at it, right? So it's like if, if you and I as adults have to go learn Japanese, it's going to take a hell of a long time. But Japanese kids just prattle away, no problem, right? Mm. 
And so there is a window of opportunity that you have to get this information layer down in the brain. And if you do it then, it becomes easy and, and second nature and automatic and provides a lifetime of value. But why on earth would my daughter want, from her perspective, to learn how to read? I mean, it makes no sense to her. And I understand it. it it's like I'm just forcing her, not forcing her. It's like I'm saying we have to do something that she doesn't understand the value of. She doesn't know what amazing, wondrous gates open up when you love to read, that you will never be bored, that you will never be alone, that you will develop empathy, that reading is a chance to try somebody else's life on for size, that reading is a chance to see and truly understand somebody else's thought processes in a direct way, which we can never do except through reading. But don't you think reading, the, is, a way, time... reading is a way to commune with the dead? Reading is the great gift passed through the portal of time from people who are now dust that we can read the thoughts of people 2,500 years ago. I mean, it's, it's, it's a brain Borg miracle of 26 letters. And so I explained that to her. And of course, that doesn't make any sense to her. I mean, it does at an abstract level, but she doesn't know what it means. And so I, like, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I have to. I have to teach you how to read. You have to learn how to read. This is not a choice. And you have to do it now because later it's going to be a hundred times, literally a hundred times harder. I mean, basically you think you're crying now, trying learning it when you're 10 or 11, right? So I'm not imposing my will on her. I'm not forcing her to do something. I'm not just being an authoritarian jerk. I am informing her of the facts of reality. Her brain is ready now. It will be way easier if she does it now. She has to learn how to read. I'm simply informing her of the facts. And then if she says, well, I really don't want to, then I say, well, I'm sorry, you don't get to make that choice. Because you are not responsible for delivering yourself to an adult. To an adult, Isabella, you are not responsible for delivering a literate child to an adult. That's my responsibility as a father. That's my job. In the same way, you are not responsible to deliver a child with fewer than 11 cavities to the age of six. That's my job as a father. That's not your, your job is to learn and play and have fun and get hugs and giggles and chats and fantastic stuff. And we, we play, you know, ice dragons and <laughs> kitties with wings and all that great kind of junk. But... It is my job as a father to deliver a literate child to you as an adult. And that's not my fault. I didn't invent English. I didn't invent all these books. It's just the reality. Well, I don't want to do it. Well, that's not your choice. And like, I'm sorry, but it's not. And that's a true statement. It is not her choice what she gets to eat. It is not her choice whether she wants to watch four seasons of The Walking Dead. It is not her choice whether she wants to play through Grand Theft Auto. It is not her choice to watch all the Saw movies at three o'clock in the morning because I, I need to deliver a non-traumatized child to her adult self, right? And I, that's not me imposing my will. It's just a simple fact that her brain is one quarter the size of mine. Her life experience is infinitely less than mine. Her studying of parenting, her study of education is infinitely less than mine. I've had the great good fortune to talk to dozens of parenting experts as part of this show. My wife is trained in child development. It's why our marriage works. So it, it is not her choice. I'm not imposing my will. I'm informing her of the facts of reality. Sorry, you have to learn how to read. I get it's frustrating. I sympathize with that. I will try and make it as fun and as easy as possible. But, but don't, you don't have the choice to not do it. Sorry, go ahead. But don't you think at the age of 15, they have the mental capacity to appreciate that if they sit around playing computer games all day, that they're not going to have any value to offer society? I mean, that's just I don't obvious. know why you're giving me all these theoreticals when you have a child who has done just that for three years. Well, this is what's baffling me so much is that she... she it's not she, baffling because she, she you won't impose it. any authority on her. You won't impose any reality. Authority is the wrong word. You won't impose any reality on but her. But I did when she was younger. The reality, the is, you the reality is that she's not getting it. The reality is that she's not intrinsically motivated. So she's just going to have to do things until she understands the reward of intrinsic motivation. In other words... When you are a kid, I'm sorry to interrupt, I'll, I'll shut up in a sec, but when you're a kid, you don't understand the value of hard work. It is only after the value of hard work that you understand why it's so important. 
So the, the idea that a 15-year-old would rather, or a 13 or a 12-year-old when she started, would rather play computer games than learn vector calculus, it would be incomprehensible if that was the opposite way. Yeah, but she has enriched her mind in other ways, like she's interested in history and, in, and English and languages and guitar and music, you know. So it's not been completely but, but no, 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 no. to me. But, but being interested in doesn't mean shit in life, Mark. Yeah, but she's still young. Being interested in stuff doesn't, like, I'm interested in antiques. Does that mean I get a TV show? No, and I'm not actually interested in antiques. Having interests is, who cares? I like playing bridge. Can I have a paycheck? Well, no, because if you want to play bridge for a living, you've got to put your 10,000 hours in of studying strategy and reading books and practicing and doing all the boring, stupid shit that it takes to become really good at something. If you want to write great songs, you've got to spend about 10,000 hours writing shitty derivative songs, and then you get your magic key to the kingdom of originality. Right? So you have to do the hard work with the knowledge that there's simply no other way to do it. There's simply no other way to do it. But you're withholding that reality from her. Now, now I'm you may just be trying to work out how her. to motivate her. You can't motivate her. I'm you can't. I mean, I? You, you're saying, <laughs> how can I climb into my child's skin and move the levers of her brain so she does what I want? But I, mean, I have said to her, I said, look, look, Lucy, it's your life. What are you going to do with it? You know, you, I have said it so many no, times. No, but you're asking not... her questions, which isn't working. I still don't know what to do then. <laughs> you, she's told you what to do. Yeah, of course. She's that. begging you yeah. for what to do. She has the wisdom, at least, of knowing what she doesn't know. Mm. Yeah. Right? What has she asked you and begged you and requested that you do? Yeah, she wants structure. She wants me to say, this is what you're going to do at these times. And yeah, hey, I get it. So, but, 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 but my Stefan, suggestion is... We yeah, have, yeah, go ahead. We have tried that. And when she comes up oh, against you don't try, something... You don't try that. You don't try having authority. Well, well, we've tried that method of, of you know, having a structured time for learning. I'll sit down with her and go through the maths. And she'll come up against something that she finds confusing. And she'll say, well, you're not explaining it to me. And then she'll, she'll run off. Right. So then you recognize <laughs> that you are unable to teach your daughter and you get someone else to teach her. Right. And that's why she went back to school. But that didn't work either. <laughs> well, no. But, <laughs> but that's because... I mean, I hope you understand that you set her up for failure with that. I have to be blunt with you. You didn't measure, you didn't do a, a knowledge gap, mm. right? You didn't do a, a skills gap and you didn't find ways to help her close that skills gap. Yeah. You didn't um, get a tutor in who's, who's used to teaching 15-year-olds. Have that tutor assess your daughter and create a six-month game plan to get her up to speed to get ready for school, right? Mm. Somebody just wrote and said, well, there are four kids in... in uh, Australia, who were unschooled and blah, 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 and they all have high-powered careers. My God, I mean, <laughs> I know a tall Chinese guy, <laughs> right? Yes, there are kids who are born with extraordinary motivation. There are kids who are born with extraordinary IQs. I get it. I get it. I understand that. But that's not everyone, right? My daughter uh, is not uh, some super genius who's now, like, there are some kids who are there five, and they've read, like, 50 books, right? That's... <laughs> Yeah. My daughter, right? So most of us have to deal with somewhere in the middle of the bell curve, right? Yes, it's true that Einstein was working in a patent office when he came up with the general theory of relativity. That doesn't mean that everyone who works at the patent office is a budding physics genius, right? That's because he was so, bored, right? <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah. No, it's because he was Einstein. And when they cut open his brain after he was dead, they found like a massively enlarged mathematical center. Whether that was genetic or trained, I don't know. Mm. But there was a giant, the numerical processing center was like a tumor. It was so huge, right? So...